Okay. Hi, Riley Redgate. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming Good. on the show. Thanks for having it. me. It's a pleasure. So you've got a book out. Your new book is called, what's it called? It's called Alone Out Here. Okay. Um, and yes. th this is sort of a departure from what you've been writing. Is that correct? That's true. Yes. My first um, three books were kind of grounded contemporary novels. Um, and this is a sci-fi space thriller. So yeah, different space. Why did you decide to go into space and write a sci-fi? <laughs> Well, it's it's actually it's strange. Most of the ideas that I have are speculative in some way. So most of my book concepts are either fantasy, science fiction, or or heightened somewhat. Um, it just so happened that my first book um, was a sort of a slice of life coming of age story, um, and then. Um, following off of that first book, my publisher was interested in the ideas that I had that were also grounded contemporaries. So when I would send them lists of ideas, they'd be like, okay, do this contemporary one. So that kind of lasted for three books in a row. So in a sense, like, I I feel as if I'm kind of coming back to um, my kind of core interests a bit um, now, that I'm, now that I'm in the speculative space. Okay. How many books have you written altogether? This is my fourth published book, but I mean, in terms of projects that I've finished drafts of, that's got to be, you know, like 12 to 15 or so um, sitting around. Um, some of them are, you know, not worth looking at. Um, and in fact, I would be mortified if anyone were to look at them. Um, but some of them are, are in various stages of rehabilitation uh, and may see the light of day someday, hopefully. Okay, you know what? I, I have asked that question incorrectly about three times now. <laughs> and I have to remember to do that because every time I've asked an author, how many books have you written? I get the same answer. I get, well, I've published four, but I've written 422. <laughs> so I apologize. I, I no, actually no. meant to say how many have been published. Sure. Um, sure. Okay, so you've had four published and are all of them in the young adult genre? Yes, yes. So far, all are YA. Um, I have projects in kind of other genres spinning around behind the scenes, um, some for the younger middle grade group and others for adults. Um, but yeah, young adult is what I started writing when I was in high school myself. Um, and the momentum in that genre has sort of kept me rolling. I like the genre a lot. And so, yeah. Young adult is what age group? Um, it's, it can be anywhere from, um, you might see like publisher recommended ages on the books between 14 and 18, or sometimes if you're in kind of upper YA, then you'll get like 16 to 20 or so. Um, yeah, it's a lot of kind of upper young adult is pretty accessible to, to readers of all ages. Um, so it really just, uh, yeah, it's a recommended age group from the publisher and it will determine kind of which imprints will be looking at buying and distributing the book. But um, yeah, especially in upper YA, which is generally what I tend to write, it, it is meant to be, you know, could be readable by anyone who might be interested in reading about teenagers. Well, let me ask you something, and I hope this isn't too technical, but <laughs> uh, there are like a billion genres out there of books. There used to be about four. And <laughs> it, now there's genres and subgenres and sub subgenres. What constitutes young adult? In other words, what can you not have? Is it just the explicit level that, that makes it a young adult? Like it has to be a little bit cleaner than a full blown adult? Uh, or how does that work? Yeah, it's tough to say. It's it's such a flexible designation because for every like potential rule that I would be trying to think up in my head, you know, like, oh, why I can't have as much cursing, but then there are really, really foul mouthed YA books out there. And, you know, if I'm thinking um, uh, a young adult book needs to have a certain lower level of, for instance, like sexual content, then, you know, there are books that that have explicit sexual material and that are dealing with with sex issues and stuff. I think probably the only uf unifying feature throughout the entire genre would be that they tend to star teenagers. So I don't think you would really find 
a YA book that did not have a young adult character at, at the heart of it. Um, but otherwise, pretty much anything goes. As you say, there are so many different genres, so many different subgenres, and under the umbrella of young adult, you can find anything from, you know, very like slow paced literary projects to like extremely like hyper commercial, like fantasy and sci-fi. Like it's, it really runs the gamut. All right. Well, I learned something today because I, <laughs> like I said, there's too many genres for me to keep up with what is what. And it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. When you get into the microscopic stuff, like, you know, um, here's a like dark academia space opera crossover, then you're like, <laughs> okay, that's just one specific book, though. Yeah. Um, and it's funny yeah. because I've never purchased a book or been interested in reading a book based on the genre. It's mm. always based on the author to me. Right. Now, I don't know if everybody does that, but that's just the way I pick a book. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that'll vary from reader to reader. I know for sure there are a lot of readers out there who will seek out subgenres that they that they really latch onto, um, like dark academia, which I just mentioned, is like such a specific niche that seemed to sort of take its heritage from Donna Tartt's The Secret History, and now it's you know it's a very small but like very specific tone and mood, and a lot of these readers are very excited about like the specific parameters of that genre. And I think that's that's true of a lot of kind of niche spaces. Do you think that with having so many of these genres that it restricts the author? I mean, if, if mm -hmm. I was trying specifically to write in a particular genre, I'd have to be really careful not to go out of the boundaries of what is considered acceptable for that particular genre. Do you have that problem? I mean, does that play into your writing at all? <laughs> um, for me personally, I I don't really feel beholden to genre in in any particular way. And actually, my my favorite authors are often ones who will take genre categories and either mash them together or kind of explode them in in weird ways. Like, for instance, N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy is this kind of apocalyptic high fantasy, but she. Um, writes it in such a way that feels like almost anachronistic in terms of like tone and language. And in that way, you know, you would think that that would be transgressive for a genre that takes so much of its heritage from like, we're going to do like old timey sort of tropes. Like that's what a lot of people associate with high fantasy, but she just throws all that out the window. Um, similarly, um, like Patrick Ness's Chaos, Chaos Walking trilogy, I really love. And that is, you know, is it sci-fi? Is it fantasy? Is it like a war novel? What, what is it? It's difficult to characterize. So in terms of like my personal interests and, and inspirations, I, I don't feel as if I want to adhere to strict genre expectations pretty much ever. Um, and I do think that pretty much you know, if an author is writing to a very niche genre and they are obsessed with that genre, then maybe the tropes that are usually found in that genre will bring them joy and they will just want to play around with those tropes. But I think probably like more of the writers I know are interested in infusing uh, whichever genre they're working in with something that they feel to be either unique to their interests or something that comes from a different kind of space in whatever way. So they're not just kind of recycling a sort of genre monomyth, I guess. I guess it's kind of like musicians when they start putting together all different types of music, wanting mm -hmm. to come up with something new. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we only have a few minutes and I want to zero in on your book a little bit. Your first talking point, I'm just going to read this because I find it interesting and get your take on it. It says, uh, Alone Out There is accurately described as Lord of the Flies in space. <laughs> Yes. Well, now I know the is, story of Lord of the Flies. How, why has it been paralleled with that? Yeah, so I can give like a, a brief, like one minute sort of pitch of the book. Um, it is set in the year 2072 um, in the kind of shadow of a forthcoming climate apocalypse triggered by a volcanic eruption. Um, so knowing that this is on the way, the world's leaders and engineers and scientists are trying to rally together to build a fleet of generation spaceships to get a certain percentage of humanity off of the Earth safely to some distant planet. Um, so there are a group of kids, of teenagers, who are touring um, the prototype spaceship, the only completed spaceship, about like a little bit less than a year 
uh, before this volcanic eruption is forecasted to happen. And of course, while they're touring it, that is when the eruption happens. It happens way ahead of schedule. And these kids on this only completed ship are the only ones to make it off of the dying Earth alive. Um, and they have to sort of grapple with the weight of um, being the last human beings um, to, you know, to survive. Um, and the question, kind of the central question of the book is whether they'll be able to form a new and functioning society aboard the ship or whether they will inherit a lot of the kind of socio-political um, tough stuff that was happening on Earth when they when they blasted off. Um, so yeah, I think if for anyone who is familiar with Lord of the Flies in space, or <laughs> with Lord of the Flies, they will be able to see how this is a sort of space take on similar themes, the isolation, the kind of politics of the group. So the kids find themselves on their own, and they've got to come up with basically their own society. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, well, that's, that's the, the struggle. There's the parallel. All right, that's yeah. good. Mixed race heritage, Irish and Chinese. Well, now that's an interesting mix, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's you, um, okay. Uh, how growing up mixed race influenced her writing? Did it influence your writing? Yeah. You know, that's a great question. I, I hesitate to ascribe too much of my interests to something that was pretty much completely out of my control. Um, I do think that like growing up in an immigrant household and in a multinational household, probably instilled more of a like a native interest uh, in me in um, maybe stories involving international characters. This group of kids aboard the spaceship is kids from all over the world. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that there's anything um, about my my writing that anyone could necessarily look at it and immediately know, ah, yes, this is a mixed race person writing. Um, yeah, it might just have shaped my my interests in characters and kind of wide reaching casts, if anything. I think a lot of that and not to get too political, but I think a lot <laughs> of that is hype and a bit overblown because I don't think that people write based on their race unless it's specifically towards a particular racial issue. Mm. Yeah, because I, it's cultural and it's environmental that mm. inspires and and creates the dialogue that we use, right? Right. I, yeah, I, I have, I go back and forth on this. On one hand, like I, growing up as like a, an Asian American person, I didn't kind of realize that I was feeling kind of a lack of like representation and seeing people in my kind of general demographic categories in fiction until that sort of started showing up and did feel meaningful to me. So on one hand, like I definitely understand um, authors who are like, you know, I went ages without seeing anybody like me in the media and I would like to, you know, I would like to create some of that sort of mirror effect for uh, especially young readers or, you know, like readers of any kind. Um, so there is that. Um, but I do think that you're right that it's not like, you know, it's not determinism. Like there's there's no reason that someone, for instance, who didn't grow up if, with immigrant parents couldn't also be interested in immigrant stories or in stories of mixed race folks or, yeah, it's, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one, um, thing. Right. Well, also the United States is unique in that essentially we're all immigrants. It's just <laughs> exactly when they got here. Some people got here mm -hmm. before other people. But if you go to a very homogenous country like China or Japan, mm -hmm. you're not going to have that same issue because you're either them or you're not. Sure. They, they don't sure. view the world as we're this giant melting pot. They view it as yeah. a very one nationalistic sort of focus. Yeah. Um, so in the United States, yeah. we have that issue here. It's unique to us. It's unique mm -hmm. to America. I think a lot of countries like struggle with like multiculturalism and people who want to preserve some kind of feeling of, of nationalism and view other, you know, groups who are perceived as different as somehow encroaching on, on a national identity. So in that regard, I don't think that the U.S. is is unique, but I do think that it is like uncommon um, to have this feeling that, you know, as such a young country, um, 
we do have sort of a shared immigrant identity. But that's not to say that people are, you know, people are immediately accepting of immigrant folks in the U.S. or to, I mean, I think that like immigrants in the U.S. will still have feelings of of being um, othered and still being kind of on the fringes of society in a way that someone who, you know, has family going back generations and generations in the U.S. Um, well, that's would, just would it. Not feel. That's um, just it. It's always the ones that came next. Yeah. The, the um, ones that got there first persecuted the next group and the next group and the next group. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just what a went thing on to inherit. Um, yeah. And that's that's been going on for, for centuries in this country. And I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying that's what's been happening. But I think over time, we're getting better. We may still have a ways to go. But, yeah, but I think crossed. it's improving. All right. Well, I think on that, uh, we need to wind this down. Thank you so much for coming on. Do you have a Thanks website you that you want to give out? Sure. Yes. Um, my site is RileyRedgate.com. Um, and it is not quite up to date, but I'm working on it. Um, and I also have an Instagram, which is at RileyRedgate. And people can find your book and information about you on the website. I sure can. Okay, yeah. the book is out, right? I forgot to ask. That. It is. Yes, it hit shelves last Tuesday. Okay, um, so, yeah. Super. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on and uh, best Thank of luck you. with the book. I hope it does well. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for a great conversation.